After my recent repair series on the Spectrum from Hell, it would be fair to assume I sit in the Sinclair camp, glaring furiously over at the C64 fanboys and fangirls, jealous of their more advanced custom chips and real keyboard. But two things. One, I'm not a gatekeeping elitist snob. Not about computers, my views on Star Trek versus Star Wars are extreme and not safe for work. And two, although I owned a 48k ZX Spectrum when I was a small lad, much later when they stopped being too expensive and I had my own money to spend, I owned a C64. More precisely, a C64C. And I didn't buy it, my wife-to-be did. For Christmas. It's still one of the best Christmas presents I ever received. I own many ZX Spectrums. Some of them work. Some of them have some assembly required. But until recently, I only owned the 1C64. This wasn't through lack of effort, but more down to them being rare as rocking horse nuggets. At least around these parts. I did get excited when I saw this advert in the local small ads. It's Facebook Marketplace, but I don't like to say Facebook too often. It can summon evil spirits. Facebook! Ah, nuts. A C64 for sale near me for a reasonable price. And it's very local. Ah, oh dear. Look a little closer. Okay, it's a VIC-20. Not as desirable and for that price, not as good value. I bought it anyway and it turned out to be a really nice little machine. A few months later, I traded a spare Atari 2600 for a working C64. This was a good deal. Thank you, Dirk Ninja. But there was something fundamentally wrong. The C64 was fully working and required no work whatsoever. I was understandably crushed. And then back in March this year, 2022 for you time travellers, I spotted an ad on Markbook Faceplace with the words that really caught my eye. Will not turn on. A very nice young lady called Leanne sold the stricken computer to me and even delivered it to my door. I know she will be watching this video, so hi Leanne. I bought it in the full knowledge it was a non-working machine. In fact, if pushed, I might have paid extra for it. I'd never seen a broken C64, let alone worked on one. Leanne had acquired this to source replacement keys for her working C64, but sadly the two keyboards used different posts. Good for me though. She'd also made a start on cleaning the case and motherboard and kindly supplied these photos of the before state of the machine. There's some heavy corrosion and crustiness around the CPU and PLA, which we will see more of later. No spoilers. First things first, remove the SID chip and check it in a working C64. Fortunately, my working machine is the exact same revision as this one, which will make testing and comparing things easier. The SID is making noises a SID should make, so that gets stored safely away until it's needed. No point risking it in a known broken machine. The only other socketed chip here is the VIC-2. This was also removed and tested in the other C64. And is also working fine. Phew! Two expensive functional chips. Off to a good start. I ran through all the standard checks, visual and voltage, and not much, apart from this, really stood out as a problem. Which is a shame, as some of the actual faults turned out to be staring me in the face. On the back of the board, there was little evidence of previous work. Only the modulator looked to have been changed at some point, and the power switch had been reflowed. I might not have repaired a C64 before, but I've certainly watched a lot of videos from the likes of Gadget UK, Adrian's Digital Basement, and Yan Beta. All excellent channels. I also follow and interact with the lovely Commodore lad on Twitter. A man who owns the ultimate Commodore collection, and I will fight you if you say different. So with all this borrowed knowledge, I felt in a good position to attempt my first C64 repair. Adam, the aforementioned lad, often shares his C64 repairs on Twitter. And being the lovely Commodore lad that he is, is always helping others diagnose and fix their own machines. The first thing he pointed out was the full set of MT branded RAM chips lurking on this board. Get those out and replace them was his advice. So I did. As I've mentioned already, this is my first time working on one of these and I was a little apprehensive. What if my ZX Spectrum honed desoldering skills were only useful on half melted ZX Spectrums? Is there something about C64 boards that makes them tricky to work on? I'd certainly seen a few videos where the struggle to remove chips from boards was real, 
resulting in ripped traces and pads. But nope, I've sped this up and I can tell you from the raw footage it took me 25 minutes to remove all eight ICs from the board. That included testing each one. This isn't meant as a brag, although it really sounds like one, but I wanted to point out that as long as you use the right tools and work out a safe method for each type of job, anyone can do this. I know some swear by hand desoldering pumps and while I really do like my engineer branded pump, using that I wouldn't be able to get this amount of chips off the board this fast without a single bit of damage. I've tried it, it doesn't work for me. My Duratool desoldering station is probably the tool that saved me the most amount of time and hassle. To head off the questions, I'll quickly run through my method. You will need... Oh, good quality temperature control soldering iron! These are not expensive. I paid around £35 for my pine seal iron and it's fab. Lead base solder! You can try this with lead free, but you'll need to crank the temperature up another 50 odd degrees. And that will almost certainly result in some damage. Or it would if I were doing it. Solder wick! Good quality is a must. The good stuff means you need to put less heat into the board and that is a good thing. Links will be available in the description for all of this. Uh, temperature control desoldering station. The Duratool one or its many fellow clones is a good choice. It's not too expensive and does a wonderful job once you get the hang of it. It is unfortunately made of cheap materials and will break often. But despite this, it's still worth it. Most soldering irons will likely not be calibrated accurately, but a temperature of around 330 degrees, at least on my iron, is just about Goldilocks. I set both my soldering iron and desoldering station to this temperature, and I've had excellent results with the materials I use. Stage one! Dilute whatever crappy solder is already on the board. In this case, it's mostly original and probably lead-based. But adding a good amount of extra will do two things. One, the flux in the new solder will burn away oxidization on the old solder joint. And two, it will give the joint a bigger surface area for the tip of the desoldering station, allowing for better thermal conductivity. This is a good thing because you ideally want the heat to transfer through to the other side of the board without heating the board for too long. Stage two. Suck out the solder. I use the wiggle method with a little extra suction on the way out. Saucy. You need to be careful not to scrape the nozzle around too hard. It's actually possible to damage fragile traces doing this. And don't stress too much if you don't get it all out on the first time. Patience is the key here. Rushing only makes quick mistakes. Wiggle the nozzle as it heats and continue to wiggle it as you pull the trigger. Keep pulling the trigger as you take the nozzle away from the board. That will help keep the nozzle of the desoldering gun clear. If it didn't clear, add a glob more fresh solder and try again. If it's a thick trace, allow it to heat for a little longer. Stage three. The wiggle test. This isn't like the wiggle method. Take a pair of rounded tweezers or similar and wiggle each pin. This achieves a couple of things. Sometimes there will be a small amount of solder still holding the pin to the via. Often that will break away with a wiggle. The other thing it does is tell you if the pin is free and you're ready to lift the chip. If it feels stiff <clears throat> and doesn't want to wiggle, you'll need to add fresh solder to the joint and start again. Stage four. Lift the chip. Before you do, inspect the joints on the top side of the board. With thin legs on a chip, it can feel like the pin is free on the bottom of the board, but it can still be attached on the top side. This is especially true for thick power and ground traces. If this is the case, then you have a couple of options. I like to use a little braid where I can fit it down beside the chip to mop up the last bits of solder. Once that's gone, I gently lever the chip up a little at a time at each end, working it loose. Another method is to heat the area with a hot air station melting the last bits and freeing the chip. I'll use either method depending on the situation. So this is how I do it. If you follow it and all the traces melt and the board explodes, I take no responsibility. You're definitely on your own. Right, back to the repair. I do like to make these videos more complicated than they need to be. With the memory removed, one of the chips tests as faulty. 
With a set of new sockets fitted, I put the working MT RAM back in the board and replaced the faulty one with a spare chip. And... <gasps> it now boots to basic. Short video. I won't pretend to do a false ending. Some people will stop watching as soon as they smell. Thank you for watching. No, wait, don't switch off. My camera seems to hate this screen displaying C64 blues, so my apologies for that. But the basic screen is there. To test for faults, I needed a test cartridge. Luckily, I had this board for Sven Peterson's Diag 64 cart waiting to be put to good use. I grabbed all the parts. Crazy to think I now have a workshop which contains enough random components that I can put something like this together without ordering parts and built the board up. This would give me a cart that can do either dead test or the standard C64 diagnostics. Why would you need both? Good question. Ram test one is bad. For something like this. The full diagnostics shows there's still a memory fault. The dead test diagnostics shows no fault. It could be the MT RAM I removed and then replaced. I ordered a new set new of chips. old stock 4164 chips from Adam Commodore Lad and waited for a short while for those to be delivered. With those installed, the error remained. I tapped up Adam once more and he pointed me to the PLA. That one. And look at that mess under there. I need to do something with that. One of the most common chips to fail in a C64, and judging by the corrosion around this area, a likely candidate. So, out that came. What is all of that? All of what? What are you looking at? Oh. That is disgusting. Just like your mum? I think it's had dirt in it. Just like it. Oh, no, that doesn't work. If that's under there, then it's, oh, it's also going to be under the CPU. One day, I might make more of an effort to fix the obvious. You'll see the CPU later. Adam kindly provided me with a working modern replacement PLA, which I did fit later, but to get this tested quickly, I removed the PLA from my working board and swapped them to test. PLA is good. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that horrible noise? The fault did not follow the PLA, so that isn't the problem. Trust you. Another handy hint from Adam, the VIC-2 socket is another likely failure point that could be causing problems. This was removed, replaced, and tested. No difference. Still random memory errors with the diagnostic test. Changing each time it's run. <laughs> All of the bad. Where now then? Up next on the likely to have melted inside list is all the Moss branded Logic. Poorly manufactured and prone to fail. They were removed one at a time and tested in my TL866. I need to go and check that. This one is... Normal. I fitted a socket, taking great care to make sure I don't forget to solder a leg. That would be a stupid mistake, which might cost me hours of time to track down. <coughs> oh dear. Oh, Lee. It's important to remain impartial when making these repairs. There's no place for emotion when dealing with inanimate things. I think... I think this one... This that's suspect. It looks like a dodgy, <laughs> dodgy chip. Normal. Starting to run out of dodgy moss chips. Must be this one. Normal. Oh, right. What's next? I'm going to suck at the CPU. Didn't you mention earlier something about the CPU? Is what I'm going to do. Suck it. The CPU. Can you? The C64's 6510 CPU is one of the chips that Moss got right, not prone to failure, which is probably why it took me so long to get around to testing it. I desoldered it from the board and fitted a socket, and then took the CPU out of the working board, fitted a socket to that one, and... 
This is the CPU from the sick one. Let's not fry anything. No, let's not. Stray bits of metal on the workbench are a constant hazard, and I've developed a good habit of clearing it off before testing anything. Oh, that's which on the wall. <laughs> Sigh. Go on, give me an error. I don't care. Yes. Yes, indeed. This means the CPU is faulty. But putting the working CPU into the board I'm working on results in this. It's garbage. If I press down... Something else is wrong. I can influence it. It's U14. Push down heavily on it. U14, eh? Uh, why is that one familiar? Chip legs too short, maybe? All right, so that socket's causing problems with that short-legged chip. So I'm going to remove the socket, put the chip back in. Good plan. Shouldn't be too hard to take out, what with the lack of solder holding one of the pins in. The second pad I tried to heat didn't feel quite right. I'm wondering if that was actually soldered. Well, let's rewind a moment and find out. Enhance. Oh dear. Did I miss one? Yep, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I don't think that was soldered. Just work. Yeah, <laughs> idiot. Test one, it's okay. Well, then, it looks like it's fixed. A faulty RAM chip, and best of all, a faulty CPU to make it a little more complicated. Not quite the epic journey I experienced on the last series, but a satisfying one anyway. At least this time you don't have to sit through four episodes to get to the end. I will leave you with moving images of the cleanup process, which I'm sure some of you will enjoy for some weird reason. Whilst you watch that, you weirdos, I will take a moment to thank you all for the amazing support, kind comments, donations, and just being generally amazing. Your consistently positive interactions are the reason I do this. So well done you. Right now I've patronized you all enough. Uh, it's time to say goodbye. I will see you next time. Bye.
Ich habe die Kanäle gesehen, 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 ich habe die